Ladies and gentlemen, you have been listening to the violin stylings of Preston Bell Charles III. We'll be hearing a lot more from him throughout the evening. Hello, my name is David Levy, and I am a co-founder of True Theater, and I will be your MC for this evening. Helping us out tonight behind the scenes are our technical director, my friend and fellow board member, Jackson Short, and our True Theater production manager and friend of mine for nearly three decades, Annette Uchi. Folks, I was tickled as the uh, registrations for the Zoom links were coming in and I saw so many names of folks that have been with us before. Love seeing you come back time and time again. It is so great, especially since We've been doing this online for a year and a half now. I was equally delighted to see a lot of new names tonight. Uh, for all of you first timers, a special first timers welcome. We have been doing this since 2010, every three months, producing a storytelling event featuring five people from wherever we could find them, telling true personal stories on whatever the one word theme is of the evening. Tonight, the theme is neighbors. Now that theme was voted on by our Zoom audience last year at this time. And I would love to give you an opportunity to vote on the theme for season 12, since today is the season 11 closer, but we're still in the planning stages of that and haven't even decided what those themes might be. However, I can tell you this, when season 12 begins at the end of October, COVID variant depending, it will be live and in person back at Memorial Hall in downtown Cincinnati. For all the information you want about that, when it happens, when the dates are revealed, when the themes are revealed, you got to get on our mailing list. And to do that, you just go to our website at truetheater.org, scroll down to the bottom, there's a little mailing list link right there and get on it. You'll be the first people to know when we make that announcement. And once you get that, you'll also be able to get the subscriptions that we'll be selling at the lowest prices we'll be making them available. And uh, you get that information first as part of our mailing list. So get on there. You could even go right now and do that while I'm talking. Um, I'm used to people ignoring me. All right. So I also want to mention though, that before season 12 begins, in fact, as early as the end of next month, we have a special off-season one-off show that I'm going to tell you about after intermission. If you're on our mailing list already, you know a little bit about it, and I'm very excited to be telling you about that uh, in just a bit. Hey, and speaking about neighbors, when you registered to be a part of our Zoom audience, assuming you're watching us from the Zoom audience, you had an opportunity to fill in uh, some details about the favorite thing your neighbors have ever done for you. And your answers were incredible. I want to share some of those with you now. Jillian, Debbie, Kathy, Holly, Jean, Rachel, and Susan all reported that their neighbors shoveled their snow or cut their grass for them. And for some of them at times when doing so was understandably the last thing you wanted to think about. Patricia, Matthew, Camille, and Lori reported that their neighbors helped them to move. That's no small ask. John's made him a deep fried turkey. Howard's made him homemade pot brownies. Oh, way to go, Howard. Jay sang Ave Maria at his wedding. Terrence can't count the number of ways his neighbors have cared for his family. And Amy says her neighbors practically adopted them. Mary Joes helped her carry something heavy. Sarah's and Cecilia's both happily handled big personal tasks for them when they were out of town and couldn't deal with them themselves. I can't imagine how this happens, but Mary Joes' neighbor helped her get her dog off the roof. And Jim's neighbor and Deborah's neighbor helped them with their respective cats. Scott's let his family stay the night when they locked themselves out of their house, oh dear. And Denise's took her daughter in and fed her breakfast when the babysitter had overslept. Connie seems to know just the right time to share a pot of soup. And Megan's just showed up with Chinese food to be supportive the day her husband passed away. I don't know what this means, but Sean writes that the nicest thing his neighbors ever did for him is didn't burn our house down like Frank did in the summer of 1977. Frank, if you're out there, it sounds like uh, you owe someone a long overdue apology. I'll share some more of the responses that we got later, uh, later on in the show, but thank you for sharing your stories with us. Uh, they mean a lot and they're really terrific and, and most of you seem to have really great neighbors. That's wonderful. By the way, not to rub it in the people watching on Facebook's face, but we've got a couple of contests here that people can participate in tonight to win a True Theater coffee mug. 
kind of like this one with the True Theater logo on it. It'll have your name personalized on it and the show poster. This is not the show poster for tonight, but, but you'll get this personalized coffee mug. Uh, some of you already noticed the first contest was on the screen when you were logging in. And we'll have the responses to that contest later, as well as the answers for those of you who missed it. And at intermission, we'll have what's uh, what I'm referring to as an audible contest. And I'll explain that when we get closer. Folks, uh, we have been very, very happy and ecstatic to be able to provide, this is our seventh show that we're live streaming now uh, during lockdown and the pandemic. And um, we've been able to do that free to anyone with an internet connection and something to watch it on and we're so glad to do it. We, however, are not without expenses to keep our lights on. And if you feel so inclined, and keep in mind, I'm being 100% sincere when I say if, if talk of donations bothers you, cover your ears, because I'd rather you just sit back, relax, and enjoy the stories tonight. But I am going to mention this a couple of times. If you feel so inclined to make a donation to True Theater, you could do so by texting TRUE11, T-R-U-E-1-1, to the number 44321. You'll get a link that comes back, you click on that, and then you could enter any amount you want to donate. $10, $100, $1,000, one seriously, no amount is too small. Uh, that's texting TRUE11, T-R-U-E-1-1, to the number 44321. And now, the reason why we're here. Folks, at True Theater, we always say that everybody has a story to tell, and the only difference between strangers and friends is the sharing of that story. Well, tonight, you're going to make five new friends. The first one tonight comes to us from Las Vegas and is the premier video poker writer and teacher in the nation. If you're serious about winning at video poker, he is required reading. In addition, he performs improv with the Las Vegas improvisational players and co-hosts a long-running weekly podcast, Gambling with an Edge. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Bob Dancer. It was early summer in 1990 when I moved into a new home for me. It was a rental property following a divorce, not my first one. My dog, Frank, and I were walking towards the mailbox when I see something that I can't be seen. It had to be Anna. She had red-orange hair, green eyes, a very slim, short-waisted figure. Must be Anna. Except, if so, Anna hasn't changed in 20 years. When Frank and I get up to the mailbox, the woman scratches Frank behind his ears. His tail wags more than any 14-year-old dog ever wagged his tail. He likes this lady. And I see that she has a tattoo that Anna didn't have 20 years ago. And her nose looked more like my sister's nose than Anna's nose. So I think I figured it out. I go, uh, hi, I'm Bob and this is Frank. Did you, uh, you look a whole lot like a lady I went to school with. Uh, is your mother's name Anna? And the woman looked up and says, why yes, what school? UCLA. We were in student housing together. I was my first year of graduate school and she was in her senior year. I haven't seen her since she graduated, she was really smart and got a fellowship to Stanford. And I said, yeah, that sounds like mom. Um, and, and so she said her name was Anna Roberta and she came along soon after, or she came along when her mom was in uh, at Stanford. But Anna Roberta said she doesn't really know her mom because Anna died when Anna Roberta was six months old. Traffic accident. I feel awful. Anna Roberta says, well, it's okay. I, uh, my dad remarried when I was five 
and I like my stepmom better than I like my dad anyway. And I'm starting UCLA as a freshman in September. So things worked out okay. So I said, great, uh, nice to meet you. We started to walk away and she goes, wait a second. Can I walk with you sometime when you and Frank are taking a walk? And I uh, would really like to know more about my mother. Do you remember anything from way back then? So I said, yeah, I have some stories. So we arranged to meet the next night, six o'clock. What I didn't tell her as I walked away was that Anna and I were actually a couple. We were together three and a half, four months. And I was the last boyfriend she had at UCLA. And I don't know how much detail Anna Roberta wants about her mother having a boyfriend, an intimate boyfriend, but I guess I'll find out. So I just, the first story I think I'll tell her, one about my birthday, where although I had known Anna since September, uh, we didn't start dating until January. My birthday's in February. And I didn't expect a present from Anna because she's a college student, didn't have much spare money. But she surprises me with a big box. It's about basketball size and in blue paper. So I start to unwrap the paper. She says, careful, careful. And I recycle paper on it and get it all unwrapped, get the lid off. Inside was a volleyball size box wrapped in Recycle Christmas paper, carefully. And then smaller, smaller, smaller. Eventually it got to a ring size box. It was kind of a sturdy box with a, with a hinge lid on top. And so I said, I looked in the ring. Fortunately it wasn't a ring because that would have been really inappropriate. And there was this piece of paper that I unwrapped it and I see it had writing on both sides. So I said, read the blue side first, read the blue side first. So, uh, so I get the paper and I go, read this side first. Sorry, I didn't have any money to buy you a birthday present. I spent all my money on wrapping paper. Turn this page over. Okay. On the side with red ink, it said, read the other side first. If you want the rest of your birthday present, you're gonna to have to let me sleep with you tonight. Um, okay, and we did, and it was a really nice birthday present. We were a couple for the last three and a half months. She was in uh, UCLA. We had, um, she was Catholic, so we used the rhythm method. I called it Vatican roulette. She didn't like that, that term very well at all, but I thought it was kind of cute. And we got away with it. So no kids, at least I think so. It occurs to me that the girl I just met could possibly be my daughter. Her name's Anna Roberta. Roberta is kind of derivative of my name. Her nose looks like it came from my gene pool. This this would not be good. I do not want kids. I had a vasectomy when I was 26 years old, so this would never happen, but I was with Anna three years before that. And since 26, I have never once regretted having the vasectomy. I have just ended more than my first marriage and don't can't keep relationships for a long time and kids are kind of forever. And, don't want that responsibility. Uh, first, I do the math. If Anna got pregnant, like we got inseminated in like May, just before she graduated, she would I wouldn't have known. And that would make Anna Roberta about 19 years old, exactly, plus or minus. So I gotta find out how old she is and, and then act accordingly. I, I'm planning on leaving Los Angeles pretty soon, but if I have a daughter, 
that can change things. And Anna has her choices. She may not want her, her life disrupted. She has a family. She has a, a future. Uh, I might not be welcome. I, I, I don't know. So don't sleep that night. Next day at work, I'm not worth much. I keep going through the possibilities and I didn't, lack of sleep didn't help. I'm thinking there's probably a 90% chance she's not my daughter because I would have been told, wouldn't I? I mean, we left on good terms. She knew my phone number. I would have been told. So she can't be my daughter. Isn't that right? Well, there's that. Maybe it's right. Maybe it's not right. So next night, Frank and I walk into the mailbox. Anna Roberta is already there. And Frank's tail is a wagon like I'd never seen a wagon before. He really likes this lady. So we go up and she greets us profusely and says, hi, I can't stay late today. I, my mother's throwing me a birthday party us with all my friends. It's a pool party. So I only can stay for like five minutes, but maybe we can plan this again for uh, soon. So I'm going, oh, birthday party, please. Don't make it your 19th birthday, please. And of course, I don't say that. What I say is, well, happy birthday, Anna Roberta. How old are you going to be? You don't look a day over 45. She laughs and says, well, I'm, I'm, only my parents call me Anna Roberta if I'm in trouble. Everybody else calls me Annie. And then she goes on and on, and I'm just gone. Please tell me how old you are. Tell me how old you are. I'm like holding my breath till finally she says, I'm 17. And I'm going, at least this time, the rhythm rhythm work. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Bob. I am familiar with sleepless nights, but that's not usually what's on my mind <laughs> when I'm having them. I am so glad things worked out for you the way that you wanted. <laughs> Folks, we're going to roll right into our second storyteller tonight. She reports that she is 73 years young and has been married to her husband, Ron, now for over 50 years. They have two grown children and five grandchildren, mazel tov. Having dropped out of high school, she fell in love with nursing, has been a nurse and taught nursing for years, went back to school at one point, and earned her master's degree at the age of 67. Her interests include gardening, volunteering with organizations that train and help people get employment, singing in her church choir, and dancing. Ladies and gentlemen, Sandy Hitzler. <laughs> Hello, I live in Cincinnati, Ohio, the queen city of the West in an area they call the West End. The West End's divided up into other areas and specifically I live in the Beth Solingworth Historic District. That's a fancy name for the West End. I, oh, sorry, uh, live in the West End, sorry. Sometimes people ask me, are you afraid to live in the West End? I say, no, these are my friends and my neighbors. They're good people. Sometimes I walk them around to let them see the neighborhood as people wave to them. I think people ask me this question because a lot of times on the news, they hear the bad news. Well, I'm here to tell you some good news about the West End. Prior to moving to Ohio, we lived just across the river in Park Hills, Kentucky. It was a nice neighborhood. It had big trees had big lots, 
in front of my particular house, I didn't have a sidewalk. It was kind of the end of the street. My house set back. Not many people walked by. Now, I knew some of my neighbors. Don't get me wrong. They were nice people. I knew a little bit. We chit-chatted, waved high, but I didn't really know them. And it wasn't a diverse neighborhood. Very, very little diversity. The West End is a very old neighborhood, one of the early settlements. It used to be huge. And as the city of Cincinnati grew, it developed little pockets of neighborhoods. I think we have 50 some odd neighborhoods here. Each time they did this, they made the West End smaller. Some of the biggest impacts it had was transportation. We went from a shipping industry to uh, trains. Each time they did this, it cut more of the West End off. The final one was when they put the expressway through, really divided it up. The city had decided that this area here, it had a lot of industry in the old days. So they moved all of them over there to another area, renamed it. Queensgate. And then was okay. They tore down a lot of the houses that they had built for all the immigrants that came here. They've tried many times to make the city different, better in the West End. Sometimes good, sometimes bad. Somewhere around 1960, they had came up with a new plan. They always got a plan. They decided that they would tear down houses that weren't livable, you know, that had bad foundations. What they th had in mind, this plan included making this a mixed income neighborhood. And it's always been a predominantly black neighborhood. The black people, families are proud of this neighborhood, but they're always being displaced. Thousands of people have, have moved out. This last plan, they thought, okay, it, they made this plan, but they couldn't get funding. All kinds of things happened. <laughs> so this area, especially the area I live, this Betts Longworth district, set for over 30 years, decaying. Houses became unlivable. But the city recognized that this area is rich in history. We have a Jewish cemetery that's 200 years old. In that Jewish cemetery, it's said to have two writers who wrote for Abraham Lincoln for his campaign speeches. Gamble from Procter & Gamble lived one street over from me. He started his soap factory here, right in the West End. We also have a little park named Porter Park. The, it's named after a woman, the first African-American woman to get a doctorate degree from the University of Cincinnati in education. She taught a lot of kids in the West End. She was very dedicated to it. Well, my husband, one other thing they did, they didn't see that working. So they tore down some more houses, built those mixed incomes. And the houses that they thought had good foundations or had history to them or good architecture, they were gonna sell for a dollar. <laughs> Can you imagine buying a house for a dollar? Well, my husband could. <laughs> he brought me down here one night, day, and we snuck in. <gasps> when I saw it, I was like, oh my God, there is no way this house could be livable. No way. How could, it, how could I ever live here? He took me upstairs. I looked down and I could see the basement on the top floor. No electricity, no bathroom looked at him and said, I don't care what you do with this, honey. I'm not living here. I'm staying in Park Hills. Well, he bought the house. <laughs> it took him eight years to rehab it. Maybe that was a good thing. I, all along, I'm saying I'm living, not going to live here. I would come down on weekends to visit him while he worked. That's the only time he could work. Walk around the neighborhood. Staying pretty close to our house. It was right on the sidewalk and on a corner. Sometimes I'd be in the yard, or what was supposed to be a yard, and people would wave and say, hi, how you doing? I'm fine. People would stop by and say, what are you doing with that old house? 
my husband's fixing it up. You gonna live there? I don't think so. Still wasn't decided. <laughs> they, when they stopped and talked, they would talk about this house and the history. <laughs> One person told me, I remember stopping there when it was a store and I bought candy there. Somebody else told me that their father was devastated when they closed it down when it was a John's hat repair shop because he loved the West End. Another person stood in the courtyard where the old oven is, stood right next to where her great grandfather baked with tears in her eyes. They told me about when their grandparents or when their great grandparents came here that were slaves and how they lived here and how they moved about. They came here in the hopes of a job, a new future. They welcomed me to the community. <laughs> I would be grateful for that forever. One of my favorite people lived right across the street, Louis. <laughs> Louis was a character, but he was instrumental in bringing this little community, this little district back to life again. He was raised here and he loved it. He used to tell me all the stories about when he lived here. He used to say, I can see a swimming pool here, a grocery store, maybe a barber shop, or I want a place where kids can play safe again. Big dreams. <laughs> About a year after we moved here, there were protests. Nothing as big as what we had last year. Still, people were in the street marching, I don't know, 500 feet from our door. I was nervous to say the least. I'd never experienced anything like that. Louis came over and talked to me before curfew. <laughs> You're gonna be okay, Sandy. You're safe. He talked to me about why people were protesting. This time they were protesting because yet again, another young black person was shot by a police officer. So many times this has happened and never, and never anything evolved, never justice, he told me. People were tired, tired of it, and they didn't know what else to do. He'd check on me all the time. <laughs> I'll never forget Louis's kindness and thoughtfulness. My protector, my friend, talked about everything, politics, religion, even my flowers. <laughs> Louis never lived to see all his dreams come true. But we did get a barbershop and the neighbors got together, fixed up Porter Park. Still no grocery store, Louis. A lot of other things around the neighborhood. He used to talk to me about a spirit in the neighborhood. I didn't know what you meant. I don't know when I decided to move here, Louis. But I know it was the people that made me move here. My house did a one, husband did a wonderful job on the house. It's beautiful. But it's the people that I love with. I love the people that I go to church with, that I walk with. The people that have gotten together, Louis, and are still keeping your drive, dream alive. People like Dottie and Lisa, all the new people and all the people who have lived here. Some people have lived here forever. Your dream's still alive, Louis. That spirit's still alive, Louis. Your spirit. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sandy. As I have often heard it said, West End, Best End. Folks, we have another storyteller before a brief intermission, but first I want to announce the results of our first contest that was on the screen when you were filing into the room. We asked you to identify the names of these characters from Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, and the winner got four correct. Congratulations, Debbie Vote. 
now we owe you two mugs. I'm going to have the whole set for you soon. But we're going to be getting right on those after this show, I promise. Uh, we also owe a few other people mugs by now, too. But we are working on those. Thank you so much, Debbie, for playing. And everybody else, better luck next time. Uh, folks, this may seem like it's coming out of the blue, but it's the next thing on my script. Uh, if you're liking what you see so far and you want to make a little donation to True Theater, I had mentioned this a little bit earlier, but the thing to type is true 11, true 11, in honor of our 11th season, to the number 44321. You get a little link back and you hit that link and then you can just fill in whatever you want. As, I, as I've said, seriously, no amount is too small. We appreciate everything um, you can support us with. True 11 to 44321. And now back to our show. Our third storyteller tonight is joining us from my old stomping grounds of Long Island, New York. As a writer and PR professional for Wise Words That Matter, she has been telling other people's stories for years. Yet she used to hold her own stories back of her fears and strengths, triumphs and vulnerability. She credits, however, her wonderful mentors for encouraging her to finally start sharing her journey from scared kid to business owner and skier who happens to be blind. She says that she regards tonight as another step on her journey of sharing her story. Friends, please welcome Krista Janik. If you'd asked me before 2010 about whether the brother and sister who live next door were good neighbors, I would have said, absolutely. We went to barbecues together, we had good conversation, and there were times that I really felt like the sister especially understood me. And sometimes being a good neighbor is about just being there. Oh, that word just, you know, it doesn't do justice to what a big deal it is sometimes to actually be there for another human being. It's really not so simple. And this brother and sister who live next door were there for me in a big way. As sometimes happens when people do acts of kindness, this brother and sister decided that they wanted to remain anonymous tonight. My story started with a very mundane task. I was on the phone with the bank. Living with my parents, I was upstairs, they were downstairs, and I didn't catch anything amiss until my father picked up the phone. In this calm voice, he said, Krista, you need to hang up the phone. And I said, why dad? I'm on the phone with the bank. And there was a little pause. And with that deadly calm tone, he said, you need to hang up. It's an emergency. I was blown away. I thought, Wow, he should have been screaming at me to hang up the phone. That's certainly what I would have done. So I ran downstairs. Now, as a blind person, I can't just walk into a room and see everything immediately. Instead, I have to piece together everything that's going on as I perceive it. So while my father was on the phone dialing 911, my mother wasn't very responsive. I was worried, was she, was she breathing? And then I asked the question and she took a breath and I breathed a sigh of relief myself except there was still something very wrong. She wasn't speaking, so I went over to squeeze her hand. 
She seemed to be squeezing back, and yet she wasn't fully aware, or, or was she? I started to panic. What else causes someone not to speak but a stroke? I didn't know what was wrong. I didn't know what the problem was. She didn't seem to be bleeding or hurt, but she wasn't responsive. The ambulance came, and as the tears rolled down my face and I said goodbye and said that I loved her, I started getting really sick with worry. Meanwhile, the neighbors saw what was going on, and they came right over. I felt so shaky and sick. I was wondering, is this the day that my mother's going to die? Because my mother was the closest person to me in my family. And while I was worrying and waiting and wondering, my neighbors were kind to me. They watched over me. First, I started to do a mundane task, as soon as I got out of the bathroom anyway. I went to go and clear out the dishwasher. I thought, oh, maybe, maybe I, I'll feel better. But I started to get really dizzy as I started bending over and standing up and bending over again. So I stopped doing that. I was still getting sick. So we went to watch TV. We watched some science shows, documentary. We watched How It's Made, if I recall, my father's favorite show. We watched a comedy that I don't even rem remember the name of. But the point is that they were helping me. We were talking. They were taking my mind, well, not really off of it, but at least we had something else. They were kind to me all night long. They listened as I almost started to write my mother's eulogy. I was wondering, is this going to be the day? What, what would I even say? I have no idea. What would I say? Oh my God, is this really it? They were there and they listened as I got the phone call with the news. Yes, indeed, it was a stroke and my mother needed surgery. They were injecting her to try to remove or dissolve the blood clot in her brain. Even in the wee hours of the morning when I finally started to drop off to sleep a little bit, and I woke up and said, you can go home now, I'm really okay. The neighbors, they said, no, no, we're, we're here for you. I felt bad at the time, but now I know that that was their way of, of being kind. And it really was best that I not be alone because I hadn't been very well just a couple of short hours ago. So such a simple, powerful thing, being there, really made a difference. Now my mom did survive that night and the next and the next, but she still couldn't walk and talk. And the next few weeks were very stressful. I didn't know what was going to happen. I didn't really know if I would ever get her back, even if she remained alive. Little things would set me off, especially if I was alone. Or really, just little things. I remember getting hot chocolate, drinking it, and starting to cry because my mother always used to make hot chocolate for me. And I didn't know if I would hear her voice again. My neighbors brought over sandwiches and they thought this was such a simple act, but it meant so much to me because these sandwiches were something that I could eat without thinking of my mother because she didn't make them. It sounds silly, but it's true. And 
At some point during that, those stressful weeks, something unexpected happened when I went with my uncle to the hospital. My mother had a paper and a pen, and she began to write, even though she couldn't really speak. My uncle grabbed the paper, and he said, she wrote, I love you. And those three words, I was wondering, was this wishful thinking? Was my uncle trying to be nice? Or was my mother really coming back to us? And those three little words that I had waited so long for, they were the beginning of a recovery that so many people called miraculous. My mother doesn't speak fluently to us today, but she is fluent in the way that she shared her, that she shares her affections. And those weeks seemed like months, but as long as it took, my family, friends, and my neighbors made it more bearable. Thank you. Thank you so much, Krista. And Krista's neighbors, if you're watching, thank you too. Folks, we're about to take a four minute intermission. Give you a chance to stretch your legs, fill your drinks, maybe text true 11 to 44321. We're also going to play for you during those four minutes, the audio contest that people in the Zoom session can participate in. Let me explain the audio contest real quick. We made a 30 second montage of snippets from TV theme songs that all aired on the same station in which Mr. Rogers played for so long, PBS. There's just gonna be little snippets and you have to identify as many of the six shows as you can. The 30 seconds will loop and play four times to give you a chance to hear it and put your answers in the chat box. Person who gets the most gets a mug. We have a tie. Well, we'll worry about that then. There's six shows in that montage. See if you can name all six. Ladies and gentlemen, whatever you do during intermission, we hope you'll be back for two more stories in Act Two. We'll see you in four minutes.
Well, folks, uh, we had some technical difficulties with that contest, but we're going to try to play it at the end of the show as everybody's leaving. So now you've got a reason to listen to all the things I say after the storytellers are done. Uh, thank you very much, Preston, for that beautiful music at the end there. Uh, folks, that was a great time for me to tell you a little bit more about Preston. He is the music director of the Cincinnati Hip Hop Orchestra, which debuted this past December at Music Hall and he recently received an ArtsWave Truth and Reconciliation Grant, which is a big deal. So congratulations to you, Preston. Uh, you can find him performing at many popular music and art venues around Cincinnati. You should follow him on Facebook or Instagram. He's often streaming live as well, but remember to look for his full name, Preston Bell Charles III, so you don't confuse him with his father. Uh, and if you can't wait that long to hear him play, go to his website at makeithappenmusic.com. He's got some videos and music on there. You can learn more about him. That's makeithappenmusic.com. Uh, folks, before we resume with our stories tonight, I really want to tell you about this off-season show we have coming up in August. This is uh, the first of what we hope will be a series of shows that we call True Voices. It gives us an opportunity to stand up a show at any time uh, based on current events or shared experiences or just weightier topics. And this first installment of True Voices is called Behind the Rainbow Curtain. It has an LGBTQIA theme and is being produced in large part thanks to a generous grant from Artswave Pride and a donation from Timothy Gilio. Uh, so we're going to have seven storytellers at that show, and we are going to be live in person at the Woodward Theater in downtown Cincinnati. It's the first time we've ever done a show at the Woodward. Uh, I've seen shows there. It's a great place to see a shows. And because we will miss not being able to share with people who want to watch our show from wherever they want to watch it, we will also be live streaming that show for free. There are tickets to attend the show in person, and those are $10 now to the end of the month, which is right around the corner, and $15 thereafter. You can find details about that on our website at truetheater.org slash events, but you could also live stream it for free if you can't make it down. We want to share this show with everybody. We don't have the details about the live stream yet, and that's another reason to get on our mailing list, so be sure to do that. I also have some new information about another show that we'll be doing before season 12 starts. We have been invited back for the second Cincinnati Storytelling Festival, which is happening at the Madcap Education Center the weekend of October 21st through 23rd, right before we will start season 12. And we'll be doing something as part of the Cincinnati Storytelling Festival this year, like we did the first time they had the festival. This, uh, you can find out the details about the festival at cincystoryfest.com, C-I-N-C-Y storyfest.com. All, uh, all one word there, except for the dot com part, of course. So uh, we got two things coming up before season 12 starts. Very excited about that. And folks, before we get on with our next storyteller, I want to read some more of the responses that our audience wrote when they registered for the Zoom link tonight when we asked them, what is the favorite thing one of your neighbors has ever done for you? Kathy's helped her dig a ditch around her flower bed. Sherry, Sherry's neighbor left a poinsettia at her door during Christmas. 
while Nikki's left toilet paper during COVID and Marie's gave her a generator during a hurricane. Donna's went to a play with her, Javier's joined his family for dinner, Betty's became her friend, and Barb's 95-year-old neighbor hugged her and told her she knew Barb cared, and that was important to her. That's very sweet. Charlotte was suffering from a seizure when her neighbors came to help her mother and father take care of her until the ambulance came. One of our audience members, who will remain anonymous, feels she's never gotten to properly thank her old neighbors before she moved away. They helped her out while her family was still young and she had gotten very ill. In particular, one neighbor came to her house whenever she called, even when it was just to help her get from the bed to the bathroom. What made this more incredible is she often called during the day and this neighbor was a night shift police officer and would normally be sleeping during the day. But every time she called, he came happily. And uh, she's still very, very grateful for that. And finally, Amy's health issues had kept her from tending her garden and one day when she looked out the window and saw her neighbor weeding her garden, she cried with tears of appreciation. Thank you, Amy. And thank you everybody for sharing your stories with us. I loved sharing them back at you. And now to share a story of her own, our next storyteller tonight. She lives in Brooklyn and has been a lifelong Boston Red Sox fan. Normally those two things don't go together but she has been teaching community college in LA and New York for the past 30 years where she has been telling stories in the classroom and is excited now to be telling stories on the stage or whatever you call this. She has been featured on PBS's online stories from the stage, as well as at Speak Up, Grits 7x7, but that's another story. Story Club Minneapolis, the Otter Storytelling Hour, Soul Stories Live. She was a finalist in the National Storytelling Network's Grand Slam just this past weekend, in fact, and is a proud 99-second Story Slam winner. I didn't know half these things existed. I got to go look some of them up later on tonight. And she reports that she is thrilled to be telling a story here tonight at True Theater. Well, we're thrilled to have you. Ladies and gentlemen, no relation to me, and she pronounces her last name differently anyway. Please welcome Rana Levy. It's August 2019, and I'm sitting on the stoop of my quiet tree-lined Brooklyn Street with my dog. And I noticed this suspicious activity in the commercial space next to my building. Now, my street is all residential brownstones, but next door to my, my building, there happens to be a commercial space. And for the 20 years that I've lived here, I have seen it be in upscale jean store, uh, a real estate office, a cafe. Sometimes it's empty for long periods of time, but now two guys are moving in but they don't hang up a sign. They do hang a large surveillance camera and they keep the shades down all day long. So when they're moving in, I ask them what they do. And the little guy says to me in his Russian accent that they do web design. And I'm like, oh, cool, I have a website. Maybe you can help me. And the big guy in his Russian accent cuts me off and says, no. Well, that's not very neighborly of Boris and Vlad. That's what I call them, Boris, the big guy, and Vlad, the little guy. I mean, we're neighbors here. Everybody knows everybody pretty much. We have block parties. We have a Google group for my street. And whoever lives or works next door, it's, it's always pretty cordial. So I'm sitting on my stoop. And I start to notice a pattern. Guys pull up. They double park. They're hanging out. They open their doors. They, they're hanging out the cars. They're smoking cigarettes. They're looking at their phone. And they must get like a signal from Boris, because all of a sudden they jump up and Boris opens the door and escorts them in. They're in there for maybe five minutes, 10 minutes, an hour. And then Boris escorts them out. One Saturday, I'm on my stoop and I see Vlad, he gets into his red Porsche, which is parked out in front. And some guy jumps in, I don't even see him. He, I don't even know where he came from. He jumps into the passenger seat and I see Vlad pass him a wad of bills. And then this guy jumps out, doesn't walk up the sidewalk. He just walks right up the middle of the street and disappears. Mel, the guy who takes my building's trash out, I see him all the time. He's like talking with the guys and laughing. And sometimes he bumps fists. 
And I'm like, what kind of web design are they doing over there? And Mel looks at me, they buy gift cards. I I'm thinking, why don't they just go to a store and buy a gift card? What do you mean they buy gift cards? And if I had a gift card, I, how would I even know to go sell it to them that they would buy? It doesn't make any sense to me, but I'm thinking about it. And then it hits me, gift card scam. I mean, gift cards are like cash. They're untraceable. And, I, and I've, I've heard of this before. I don't know how it works because I'm not a criminal. And then I'm like, I got criminals living next door to me, which is really, really creepy. But it's also kind of exciting. I mean, it's like, cool. I don't know anybody else who has criminals and I'm sure none of my friends can say that. But I also, I have criminals living next door to me and that is, it is really creepy. So I put an email out to my street's Google group. Now my street, they're all my neighbors, but they think that a crime is when a dog like poops in a tree pit or a sidewalk and they'll shame email everybody. And then there'll be like a whole discussion about dog poop and it's not mine and this and that. And that. So I write an email and I'm explain it and say, we have criminals on the street next door to me. Nothing. So I send an email out to my building. We have a Google group and my building, I love my neighbors, but they think a crime is mixing paper and plastic and they will send out shaming emails. They'll even take a picture and send it out. And then there's a whole bunch of emails like it's not me, it's not me. I send an email and I explain that we have criminals living next door. Nothing. So I go to the 7-8, my precinct. And the desk sarge says, yeah, you know, we've heard of these, we know that they exist, but you know, we can't do anything without probable cause. And I'm thinking they're probably gonna cause a lot of problems. I don't get it. There's criminal next door and nobody can do anything about it. Screw them. You know what? I'm gonna start my own investigation. This is gonna be my dateline. This is gonna be my law and order. And I'm gonna buy a new dress because I know I have to go to court and testify against Boris and Vlad. I'm gonna bring them down. Except it's September now and I've started teaching. So my investigation is limited to um, afternoons and the weekends. I start taking pictures of all the license plates. I will like, I'll step in between like two cars and I'll kind of lean over and I'll snap a picture. Sometimes I just go right out in the street and I'll snap a picture. And at first I was like kind of nervous, like I'm going out in the street. What if they see me? And then it's like, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. The street is public property. I can do whatever I want. So now I got a, I got a photo album of 62 photos of license plates. And I've got a little notebook where I've kept notes like their hours of operation, who belongs to what car, what it looks like. So I, I'm gonna send an email to the NCO. Now that's neighborhood coordinating officer. Every neighborhood has one. It's, an, it's a police officer who's embedded in the neighborhood and she is a like a liaison between the community and the police. So I send her an email with just like a sampling of the photos of the plates and some descriptions, put it out there. Next day, I'm walking on campus and I get a phone call, caller unknown. Now, typically I would never answer a phone unless a friend, a name popped up and I wasn't even thinking about her, but I picked it up and it was the NCO and she thanked me. And she said that she ran the plates and almost all of the cars belong to guys with rap sheets and one set of plates is a stolen car. And she thanks me and she tells me, keep up the good work, but be careful. And she's gonna kick this over to grand larceny. Oh my God, grand larceny. This is it, Boris and Vlad are going down. And I wait, it's October, but I get a call. It's the, the guy from, it's the officer from grand larceny. And he thanks me <clears throat> and he asks me some questions. And then he says, is that the red Porsche double parked in front? And I'm like, yeah, and like, where is he? So I stand up from the stoop and I look around and he says, oh, you can't see me, but I'm watching. I'm like, oh my God, 
this is a stakeout. Yes, Boris and Vlad are going down. And I'm going to say to all my neighbors, I told you so. They're going to come out. There's going to be a sting. Boris and Vlad are going to walk out with handcuffs on. They're going to hold their coats over their faces, right? So the cameras don't see them. And I can see the headlines now. And the New York Post, our daily tabloid, it's going to say, sharp cookie busts crookies. And I will be famous. But nothing happens. There's no sting. There's no perp walk. Nothing. So it's like Thanksgiving. And I email the NCO and I ask what's going on, what's happening. And she emails me back and she says, you know, we're working on it. We're watching, but it takes time. You need probable cause. I hate this probable cause thing, right? Nothing's happening. And Boris and Vlad, they're still hard at work. The days are getting colder. The nights are getting shorter. There's snow on the stoop. Snow melts from the stoop. Days are getting longer. Toilet paper flies off the shelves. Restaurants, bars, stores, clothes. I order a dozen bottles of Purell from Amazon. It's March, COVID. I look out my, I'm in a lockdown. I look out my window and I see there's a, a gate over the door and a big lock and the surveillance camera is gone and Boris and Vlad disappear. And I'm disappointed. I mean, I thought I was going to bring them down. I mean, I thought I was gonna have my 15 minutes of fame, you know? I mean, I, I saw something, I said something, but nobody did anything. But now we're all in a lockdown. There's some scary virus that might kill us. Gift cards? We now got bigger things to worry about. Thank you. Thank you, Rana. If anybody else is watching from New York or has been to New York any time in the past 20 years, you know that it's plastered all over the place. If you see something, say something. Rana, I'm really glad you saw something, you said something. Sorry, it didn't turn out the way you had hoped, but uh, it's nice to know there are concerned citizens like you out there. Friends, we are going to get to that contest before the end of the evening, but first we're going to bring out our fifth storyteller tonight. He is a presenter, explorer, change maker, and traveler, as well as the founder of the Child Wellness Fund and the movement known as House of Friends, where they make bold actions of standing up for oppressed communities on social justice, with a long history of leading efforts like the Kenyans United Against Poaching and the Global March for Elephants and Rhinos, among a long list of activism actions, large and small. He is a big proponent of the philosophy that small actions always add up to change and we can all so easily do them. Hear, hear. Tonight, he shares a story of his relationship with his neighbors of nearly 20 years in the bush in the Maasai Mara in Kenya, which he is looking forward to returning to soon. Please welcome Jamie Ponte. <laughs> Neighbors, I've got some unique neighbors. I have elephants, what, giraffes, zebras, monkeys, hyenas, leopards, cheetahs, but I also have humans. Most of my humans are from the Maasai tribe. They welcomed me to live in this area of the Maasai Mara but a couple years back, I guess, before this story began. And I was down in that area building some schools and doing some work that I, I was just kind of setting out to do as far as sponsoring kids with schools and such. So 
they invited me to live in this part of community that they had and that welcomed me as their neighbors. So, yeah, this is kind of cool. I mean, that's live in the Masamara with, with all this wildlife and with some pretty good people as well. So I took them up on it. I have about 20 acres down there and they taught me how to live basically. Um, I had no clue. I, mean, I, I lived in the United States. We had water, we had electric, um, we had emergency services. And I had people that cooked for me typically or taught me how to cook here, but there it was totally different. I had to find my own water. I had to figure out where to go to the bathroom. I had to live among like deadly snakes. And my neighbors taught me how to do all of that. They really watched over me. They live, one, one set of my neighbors, uh, I'm down in the lower area and they kind of live up a little bit higher, up on a hill. And they, they, um, they would look down kind of at me. And I kind of love that idea because there was all that white savior mentality that would go on where the, the missionaries would be up on the hill concept. And, and here I am down in the lower area and they're looking down upon me. So I love the reverse. And they would send somebody down like, oh, Jamie doesn't realize there's a Cape Buffalo that's about to come up to his camp. So they would you know, send somebody down there, rush, and they'd have a, a, some weapons with them to protect them. And they would warn me that some animal was coming. So anyways, these neighbors really, I became very close with. Um, I needed them to survive. And they were gracious to show me how to live there and included me just like family. So, as time goes by, um, I have to explain too that I'm living down here in a conservancy. It's a wildlife conservancy. So uh, people own the land. The na my neighbors owned much of the land. Almost out of let's say four or five hundred people would own almost all the land within the conservancy, and a couple of thousand acres we're talking. In that land, there would be an inner circle where we kept uh, nobody lived. And that was really kept the inner core would be left for the wildlife to live. And then there's kind of an outer core where you would build your homes. Um, typical Maasai home is a manada, which is made out of mud and cow dung. And they're usually groupings like a little village, if you want to say, that are called bomas. And that would be one family or maybe two families would live with maybe 60 to 100 people in them full of kids, cows, goats, uh, mamas, you know, the, just a, a, a thriving little village. So what happened is there was a wildlife organization, a Western mentality one, uh, that wanted to take over the conservancy. This was kind of a natural thing that was happening all over Africa. And we knew that there was opportunities there and it wasn't the first time someone had tried to take over it. Now note that if this conservancy is ran by the locals, it's all 100% ran by the locals and we're capable of running it. Uh, sure, could it be ran better? Of course it could, but it works and it's been working for a long time. Matter of fact, it was one of the first conservancies really in Africa and certainly one of the first ones that were operating in full strength in the mid eighties uh, when uh, so really when tourists were start for, first starting to really travel to Africa from the U.S. in a larger capacity. So pretty good history there with it. And it was working. This uh, cartels, I'm going to call, call them, are trying to take over this conservancy. How are they trying to do that? Well, I grew up in the States, I've already told you. I happen to be sitting in Cincinnati, Ohio right now. Um, I rather I was in Kenya, to be honest with you. Um, but I'm here. Um, and I'm grateful to be able to be here to tell you the story. So these uh, cartels are doing some pretty ugly stuff. They're uh, trying to like divide the community. Imagine that, nothing that we haven't heard here in the last couple of years, but huge divides within the families that run those community, run the community and live in, and live in the conservancy. Then, if there's lodges in there and you work there and you're kind of supportive of, let's say me, somebody that's trying to advocate uh, to keep the conservancy locally owned and operated, then you'll be sent home for three months with no, no work. And, and just kind of ugly, continuous 
efforts like that, even to the point where they burned down one of the lodges that wasn't really falling into the idea that they should allow this Western organization to take over. I could see what was happening. I understood the art of war, if you want to say, the strategies that were being used. And it made me sad, but more so, I really felt that I had to stand up and protect what I saw happening. And I thought I had the ability to share and educate on this art of war strategy of these cartels. So I had to contemplate it though, because this is dangerous. Um, these, are, these are people that aren't playing games. I mean, they're there to win and to really take over what they want. And it would not only hurt me, but as I've already told you, if they were supportive of me, they would get home and lose their job or they would have uh, differences within the, the families and they'd be fighting. And then there'd be issues of fighting over cows or something of that nature. It would just kept on blossoming up. And again, just like what we know for the last couple of years in the US. So I was trying to figure out like, do I stand up? Do I not stand up? My background's definitely not keeping my voice very low. And if I see something wrong, I typically try to find a way to share. So I knew that was going to be my decision, even though I was a little scared to do it. I was a lot scared, actually. So I, I went to some of the elders and I said, you know, I'd like to call an elders meeting. This is a big deal to call an elders meeting. I've been invited to some of the elders meeting, but I've never actually called one. And to be honest with you, while I really felt part of the community, this would be a huge test. Am I really part of the community or am I just a, an extended guest? So I did, I asked the, the elders, would you please let me call a large powwow and let me try to explain what I see happening to our conservancy. There was some reluctancy to it. There were certainly people that have already been bribed to allow this transition to happen. Others that didn't really quite understand, um, if I say the art of war and the, the traps that would be laid out for them, they would uh, not really understand them and they'd fall into the traps. So anyways, they come back to me and say, we're gonna do this meeting. It's gonna be about three weeks. Believe me, time is nothing that moves fast down there. So three weeks was actually a pretty fast time to be able to hold this meeting. I used the three weeks to kind of find my allies and to try to educate. Um, and really what I did in my strength was really with the youth. I really worked with the youth to try to go back into their families, their Balmas, those villages I spoke of, for them to be able to kind of get the mamas involved, let them understand what it would be. And of course, you already know that the women run the world. And if I got the mamas involved, they would explain to the men. Well, would my strategy work? I don't know. It's time for the meeting. The meeting's about two hours away. And we're heading to this meeting. We really prepared. We thought we were really focused. We went to sleep that early that night before, you know, we got up early, we had a good breakfast. And here we are in the car moving towards this meeting. We're about 45 minutes, not even halfway, uh, heading up the only paved highway to get there that's in this area. So all of a sudden, there's this commotion, like people everywhere, cars all pulled over what's going on so we we pull over as well because that's what you do and there's just all this gawking going on and looking down on the hill so we we get out of course do a little gawking ourselves we assess what's going on we actually see that it's a vehicle that is rolled over and, it, and another vehicle that was involved as well that are it's in bad shape and part of the work that i do with my old land cruiser that moves very very slow is we actually use it as an ambulatory. So we would run people to clinics that were gonna happen on the other side of the um, Mara or something of that nature, people that needed to get to the hospital, we would hold we, uh, one, one time a, a month or something that we would get people to the hospital and we would do some emergency runs. So it wasn't unusual that my team 
would step up on some, you know, kind of medical need. No training really whatsoever, just doing what we could do. And we go down, there's people trapped inside this one vehicle. It's really bad. It looks like it's probably going to catch on fire. It is on fire a little bit, but really burn. Uh, we do what we can to get them out of the vehicle. There's a few people that are deceased. There's a few people that are really hurt. There's a few that just maybe have a broken leg, something of that nature. So we do an assessment. We get them in my vehicle, the ones that we feel need the most uh, care and we can get there the quickest. Uh, so we get them to the, the hospital about 45 minutes away, not towards my meeting. And I'm thinking, oh my Lord, I got to do this because this is what we're supposed to do. You got to help people when you have the opportunity to help people. But at the same time, I just pulled this meeting together. It took three weeks to plan. It took a lot of nerve to make it happen. And a lot of people were supporting me to do that. And now I'm not even going to be there for a couple hours. Well, I have to do what I got to do. And we're already committed. So like I said, we get to the hospital, we drop them off. They're getting the care. We get back in the car. We're like, we're quite dirty and blood's on us and mud. And because we had worked climbing under in the cars and stuff. And it's not exactly the way I thought I was going to show up at this meeting. And the adrenaline, you can imagine the adrenaline's just flowing. Not with just me, but all of my guys, we're just a mess to be honest with you. All of that planning, all of that, like getting all ready and focused was gone. We're just a mess. We're now two hours late for the meeting. We're now an hour and a half, if not farther away from the meeting. So we finally get there. It was a weird drive. We tried to talk a little bit, but then it was just silence. And of course, I already told you the Land Cruiser doesn't go very fast. It's a very old one that doesn't run well. It even shakes if we try to go too fast. So anyways, we get there. Show up where this meeting is going to be held. Area called Angora Gora. And we come out. Uh, there's, I mean, 300 plus people there. Underneath the large tree is where there's a circle of uh, the elders, the, the kind of most powerful elders are, are there sitting on the ground. And we're invited to sit in the circle with them down on the ground. A few of them had chairs or little stools or something, but uh, the others were all just lined up kind of behind. Um, and like I said, there was over 300 people here. I have translators that are with me and uh, it's my team, the guys on my team. Uh, one is a guy from the, from the local community as my neighbor, he is my neighbor, uh, the doing Ma translation. Ma is the mother tongue language of the Maasai. And Maasai is 100% well to be spoken in the meeting. So another is from another community. He's also Maasai. He's helping me. And then I have another from another tribe. And it's a little confusion, but you have to have this team. You can't go from one single uh, translator. You won't, you won't get the full story. So I know it's gonna be a complicated uh, to hear what's going on in the meeting, as well as for me to actually get my strategy and my interest of uh, saving the conservancy out. As I said, the meeting was started. There was an elder, a powerful elder. He spoke, got the thing started. As soon as he sat down, there's this other elder that pops up. It was an elder that I'm aware of. I'm not real good friends with him. I'm not close to him. But I knew that he was going to be against me on holding this meeting. And I think he was actually bribed by these cartels to push this conservancy to be taken over. So I'm a little worried. And he gets up and he starts talking and he's being pretty, like, really strong, really strong with it. And he's like going, this is this, and, that. and of course he's speaking Ma, so I have no idea what he's saying. And I'm kind of looking at my guys, hoping that they're going to tell me like a little bit, feed me in a little. And they just kind of pushed me away like, no, 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 hold on, hold on, which made it a little scarier. Like I said, I, I really thought the worst was coming. I really thought he was there to chase me from a community that I really loved. Uh, he was there to make me not be able to live there anymore, that I would have to leave because I would get hurt if I didn't. Um, the people that supported me 
that they would get punished as well. So it was, there were some big consequences here and I was really thinking the worst. So he keeps going and, and he has what we call a runga. This is a runga, it's basically a weapon for if you get caught with around wildlife. And he's taking this runga and shouting like this and going this way and this way and not angry, but just really intense. He finally starts and he's pointing it at me. And I'm like, oh my Lord. And then everybody's looking at me. They're not, and it's not like, again, it's not like they're angry at me, but I'm not really sure at this point, I already told you my whole focus was gone from the adrenaline from helping at that accident. So I'm, I'm just a mess. My guys I can tell aren't quite as focused as they probably need to be either, which is expected. And finally he sits down. He sits down and I'm kind of hoping my guys like start to tell me what's going on. They're kind of talking to each other a little bit. They're looking at me and they're smiling and they want to say one of them says, it's, it's, it's okay, it's really not that bad. <laughs> I'm thinking, oh my Lord. So I really am kicked out of the community. I really, I just messed up. I really thought I was helping and I ended up making a big mess. So then they start to explain to me a little more about what he says. He starts his conversation when he was shouting like this. And he says, they tell me that he says, I came here to chase Jamie out of this community. I wanted this conservancy to be taken over by this group. And I wanted him to leave and I didn't want him to ever be able to come back. I'm like, you can imagine my head is just like down. I'm, I'm, my tears are almost in my eyes. I'm losing something I felt really, really passionate about. I'm losing neighbors that I really loved and cared for and that cared for me. So I'm just devastated. And then they're like, no, no, hold on. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> it's, that was the good part or the bad part. And they're like, no. Then he said, but I was stopped at an accident. And I was gawking like everybody else in Kenya because they, they come and they watch, but they don't actually go down and help or anything. They really don't know what to do. And he saw Jamie's team pull up, get out of the car, assess the situation, and start to immediately help these people that they didn't even know. They saved the lives of people that they've never met. They took them to a hospital to get the care they needed. That's why Jamie's late to this meeting. That's why him and his team are so late to get to the meeting. I don't know if they shared that with everybody in the meeting beforehand or not. I, I honestly don't know, and I don't know to this day. But what he says is, if Jamie and his team are willing to help people that they don't even know, how can we as neighbors, and knowing that Jamie took this chance that was so risky that he could possibly be chased out of this community, but was doing what he thought was right for our community and for all of us neighbors living together, then I think we should listen to him. I think we should give him the chance to share a strategy to protect us from this takeover. I'm floored. I, I'm, I went from being devastated to just in awe. I, I don't know what to say. And yes, tears were still coming out of my eyes. I mean, even more so, I think now, because I felt the passion and the, the, the intensity of it at that point. So I get the chance to speak, share a little bit of my strategy. They call a vote. The entire community kind of just nods their head or waves hands and agrees to allow me to, uh, to work with them. And, and not that they needed me. They really didn't. They just needed to, to be able to see that they can stand up and do this as they have been. They don't need this to be taken over. So for me, I got to be able to kind of experience something in that moment that I'll never forget. Like I said in the beginning of the story, I needed them to teach me how to survive, and they did. We became very, very close neighbors. I became family. 
I took the last name of one of my neighbors, the family name, so I really felt like I was welcome. I was allowed to use it openly, even if I went to the market. People would doubt, like, you can't be. You're white. I'm like, no, I really am. I'm just the lost one. So I, would able to, I was able to use really this name of this family name. I was welcome in this community to a degree that was just unbelievable. They helped me, I helped them. We helped some strangers. This individual saw what was going on and saw that we could all work together to actually be neighbors and save this community and to save our culture and to really just make things work. So that's the story. I think if you really reach out and do the right thing, sometimes the right thing will come back and get you in a good way. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jamie. You know, Jamie also told me that this took place about 10 years ago and the Conservancy is still controlled by the community today. Thank you for the good work that you do, Jamie. And as far as living around elephants and lions and whatnot, well, I used to live in a fraternity house, so I totally get you there. <laughs> hey folks, this is where I would normally start the thank yous to wrap up the show, but we are going to try this audio contest again. Just a reminder, here's how it works. We're gonna play this two minute clip. It's a 30 second montage of six TV theme songs played four times. You gotta name as many of the six as you can and then you will get a True Theater coffee mug. Debbie Vote, uh, this one's just for fun for you. You already won a mug tonight. And folks for, on Facebook, feel free to play along too, but this is for the Zoom folks to win a mug. So here comes the montage. And remember there's six elements you're trying to name, all PBS TV show themes. I've been watching the answers come in and I have to tell you, there were a couple I really thought nobody was going to get, but uh, we'll have those answers for you just a, in a moment. And uh, we'll announce the winners of that mug, the mug, uh, maybe uh, uh, multiple winners as it turns out. But ladies and gentlemen, it is time to say our thank yous tonight. Thank you to all of our storytellers. That's Bob, Sandy, Krista, Rana, and Jamie. 
Thank you to Jackson and Annette running things behind the scenes. Thank you to Preston on the violin. And thank you to all these people who are just too numerous to name right now. It really does take a village to make this show work. And if you notice there at the end, it says, if you're reading this, thank you. We always say it takes two people to tell a story, one to tell and one to listen. And tonight you opened up your ears and your hearts and you listened and we thank you for that. Thank you too to everybody who took some time to donate to True Theater by texting TRUE11 to the number 44321. It's not too late to do that if you want. And an extra huge thank you to anyone who's still with us as I blather along and say all these announcements at the end of the show. I'm going to riff a little bit while we wait for the answers to come in on the, you know, I find out who the winners are. Yes, in fact, I thought it might be the case John Kimball, congratulations, you got four correct. Uh, but I wonder, is there somebody else who had a last minute uh, addition? Was there, I'm looking at it too. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Oh no, oh no, I'll have to look at it again. There may have been a tie. I thought I saw somebody enter multiple times with enough answers, but if there is, we will get back to you. Uh, folks, these are the answers. We had in fact Sesame Street, Masterpiece Theater, Zoom, Downton Abbey, The Joy of Painting, which I saw one person got, I was very surprised. And that little raspberry at the end was indeed from Monty Python's Flying Service cir Circus. So thank you everybody for playing. And folks, we're gonna wrap it up right now. Listen, we hope that we will see you soon, whether it be next month at the Woodward Theater for True Voices Behind the Rainbow Curtain, or at, in October at the Cincinnati Storytelling Festival, or in late October, for the beginning of season 12. But whenever it is that next we see you, until then, be a good neighbor and be true.